as to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And uh, may that be our heartbeat in worship today to just rejoice and to praise God uh, for sending his son uh, to come in flesh and to give his life for us that we might have life. And why don't we stand by singing about that, number 134, Alas, and Did My Savior Bleed? We'll go ahead and sing all the verses as we stand, number 134. So we ask God's blessing you offering, please.
going to sing again, hymn number 164, Nothing But the Blood, that talks about making me white as snow, just as Janice was playing. So we'll sing verses 1, 3, and 4, you may remain seated. <coughs> invite you to turn with me to one of the most remarkable passages in the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 52 and 53. We will be reading from 52 verse 13. It's remarkable because it so accurately predicts the ministry that Jesus Christ was going to fulfill and written about approximately 700 years before his coming. And so as we read this, um, notice how accurately it describes that Jesus Christ was going to give his, himself, his body, his, and shed his blood on our behalf, beginning at verse 13 of Isaiah 52. Behold, my servant shall de deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him. For that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of the dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when he shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely... He hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his, his generation? For he was cut out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. 
And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. And when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, and he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will, therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for transgressors. A wonderful passage. One more opportunity to sing together the song, There is a Fountain. And I love the last verse. It says that when this poor lisping, stammering tongue lies silent in the grave, then in an obler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to save. Rob is talking Sunday school of people who couldn't carry a tune. But we'll all be able to do that in heaven. And it's a great hope that we have because of what we just read, that Christ was willing to bear our sins in his own body on the tree. And because of that, even though we might die in the flesh, we are going to be raised again to eternal life. So we'll get you to stand with me and we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 5 of When There Is a Fountain. is going to come sing for us. <clears throat> like the woman at the well I was seeking for things that could not satisfy and then Savior speaking, draw from my well that never shall one dry. Fill my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no cup, fill it up and make me whole. There are millions in this world who are craving the pleasure earthly things afford, but none can match the wondrous treasure that I find 
in Jesus Christ my Lord. Fill my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. So, my brother, if the things this world gave you leave hungers that won't pass away, my blessed Lord will come and save you if you kneel to him and humbly pray. Fill my cup, Lord, I lift it up. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up and make me whole. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup. Fill it up and make me whole. To join me in John chapter 6 this morning, and if you have a copy of your Bible handy there, I'd invite you to follow along with me in John 6. If you don't have a copy of the scriptures with you, that's fine. I will read through uh, the passage in its entirety. And we'll be constantly referring to it this morning, so you'll be able to track with us, no problem. John 6 and verse 52. John 6, we'll start reading in verse 52, we'll read down to verse 58. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Dear Lord, these are difficult words. And I pray that your spirit will enable us to understand and that the end result of this will be that we will come, that we will see, that we will believe, that we will taste of the heavenly bread. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we begin discussing the passage that we just read, I need to lay down a couple of ground rules. This is a challenging portion of Scripture. There's no question about that at all. It's not easy to understand what Jesus is saying here. There is, as John 6 progresses, the teaching from Jesus really seems to get harder and harder. For those who have not been with us the last few weeks, after Jesus performed that monumental miracle in which he took two lo five loaves of bread and two fish and multiplied them to be able to feed a massive crowd of 5,000 men, and if you include the women and children, it would be a group upwards of 20,000 people. Right after he performed that miracle, on the east side of the Sea of Galilee, he crossed over to the west side of the Sea of Galilee, and he went to a place called Capernaum. And this verse 59 of this text, the next verse, tells us that he actually went right to the synagogue in Capernaum, and gave the teaching that he gives in John 6. There in Capernaum, which at this time 
is the base of Jesus' ministry. He has moved to Capernaum with his family. They live there. And in this place, he meets some locals there who are at the synagogue, and they hear what he has to say. But there are also several who had been on the other side of the sea with him the day before who had partaken of the bread and the fish that he had multiplied for that crowd. And so he's speaking to this group, and he's identifying himself over and over again in John 6 as the bread of life. And so appropriately, students of the scriptures have often referred to John 6 as containing the bread of life discourse, because that's exactly what it is. The reason that Jesus provided bread in the wilderness on the other side of the Sea of Galilee is so that he could get into Capernaum and share this message about the true bread from heaven, the eternal bread. And verse 51 is a great summary of all that has been said by Jesus to this point. If you look at verse 51, Jesus says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever, and the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Now there are two claims here that really summarize what Jesus has said in all of the verses prior to this in John 6. The first claim that Jesus is making is that he has come down from heaven, that his origins are in heaven. Essentially, he is saying, I am virgin born. I was brought down here. I was sent down here by God through the Holy Spirit. And when Jesus first started saying that he came from heaven, the crowd responded in verse 41 by murmuring. That's what they are doing. They are saying in verse 41, 41, because of this claim of heavenly origin, they murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And the reason they are murmuring is because they knew Jesus. They knew his family. They were living in Capernaum. And some of these people perhaps had known the family of Jesus their whole lives, and they are grumbling. How can he say he's from heaven? We know where he came from. The second issue that is summarized in verse 51 is this concept that Jesus presents that if people will eat of him, that they will have eternal life. And so, verse 51 again, if any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And this is where we left off last time. Jesus says that as the bread of life, as who has originated in heaven, I've come from heaven, as the bread of life, I can give life to those who will eat of me. And, and this, now the crowd is really messed up. They're no longer grumbling. And now in verse 52, they're angry. And they're arguing. Verse 52, they strove among themselves. That is, they argued among themselves. And we'll come back to this in a moment. But let me show you how this ends. After Jesus says what he says in verses 52 through 58, notice what happens with this crowd that was murmuring, then arguing. Look what they do in verse 60. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they heard this, this passage that we're just going through here this morning, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? And I show you this response of the crowd at the onset because we should not be surprised if this passage is confusing and perplexing to us as well. It was perplexing when Jesus said it, and we should expect that it will be met with some perplexity even to us today as we read it. And maybe as we read the text earlier, you thought to yourself, what is this? (laughs) What is Jesus talking about? This eating of flesh and drinking of blood. This is, this is grotesque language. And maybe your stomach even got a bit queasy as I read these verses. They're hard sayings. And they were taken as such when he spoke to them, to this, these words to this crowd at the synagogue in Capernaum in the first century. And we should fully expect that they will not be easy for us to digest today either. That's why we just prayed. We need the Spirit's help to understand the word. In fact, down in verse 63, we won't get there today, but Jesus makes a statement and he says, it is the spirit that quickeneth. It's the spirit that gives life. We're only going to get these sayings if the spirit helps us. And that's why, as I was preparing, I fully intended to go to the end of the chapter this morning, but we're only going to get to verse 58 because we'll never make it to the end of the chapter. And let me just lay down a couple of ground rules that will help us with this section. Let me just make two statements at the onset. First, 
Jesus is not promoting cannibalism in John 6, okay? Let me be clear on that. That may seem fairly obvious to you, but it needs to be said. When Jesus says in verse 51, 53, 54, 56, 57, and 58 that we are to eat of his flesh, he doesn't want us to literally do that. He's speaking in figurative language. Do you know what that is? If I were to say to you today, and it was raining outside, and I said it, it was raining cats and dogs, would any of you picture puppies and kitties coming out of the sky and plopping to the ground? No, it's a, it's a figure of speech. When I play with my kids, and I get on all fours, and I crawl around, and they're on my back, I say I'm a horse. And even my one-year-old understands that I am not really a horse. I am acting like a horse. I am on all fours. I say nay, and I buck, and I do all that, but I'm not a real horse. The Bible is full of that kind of speech, and we need to understand that. You know what hermeneutics is? Hermeneutics is the study of Bible interpretation. How do you read this book? And there is a variety of opinions on how you read this book. And we say, generally speaking, whenever possible, we read the book literally. Jesus, God did not give us a mysterious book. There's some challenging things in this book, but he didn't mean to hide things from us. He didn't mean to give secret meanings that we can't understand. No, he spoke in normal language that we can understand. And part of normal language is figures of speech. There are expressions that we need to account for. Whenever possible, we interpret the Bible literally, but when there is obvious figurative speech, we take it as a figure of speech. And John 6 is one of those places where we need to do that. Jesus has said repeatedly in John 6, I am the bread of life. And I don't think any of us picture Jesus as a loaf of bread. He is not a loaf of bread. He is saying, I am like bread. I am like bread, and that bread, if you eat it, it gives you some life. I, as the heavenly bread, am like that. If you partake of me, I will give you life. But there's a lot of ways in which Jesus is not like bread. He's not made of flour and water. And we understand this expression. And so when he says, eat of me, he's not saying, take my arm and take a bite out of me. He is saying, partake of me, embrace me. At some point in your life, when you were little and cute, someone, probably grandma, said to you, I could just eat you up. And and grandma didn't mean that she was going to put you in a roasting pan and cook you and get a fork and some barbecue sauce and start munching. And you knew that. At least I hope grandma didn't do that for you. She didn't do that for me. You ever heard someone say, this book is so riveting, I'm just devouring it? And you didn't picture them eating that book. Did someone share an idea with you and you said, let me chew on it? And, and, and you didn't communicate by that statement that you were actually going to write the idea on paper and start chewing on it. You wanted to think about it and interact with it for a bit. When Jesus says, I am bread, eat of me, he is speaking in figurative language. He means to urge his hearers and his readers to interact with him, to partake of, what he, of who he is, to embrace him. No cannibalism in this passage. And secondly, I need to say this. Jesus in John 6 is not talking about communion. He is not talking about the Lord's Supper in this text. A large section of the church, and I'm talking out of every denomination that is out there, there are many people who have looked at John 6 and they have said, this is talking about communion. And because they see this as communion, they have come to believe that the communion table is a means of salvation. That you get saved by coming to a service and actually partaking of the Lord's Supper. Many have believed this. Jesus says clearly in this passage that if you eat of my flesh and if you drink of my blood, you have eternal life. And if you think that he's talking about communion, you are going to come to the conclusion that if I come to a service and I take bread and I take juice and I devour these things, they become Christ and I receive eternal life by partaking of these elements. And if you are reading it that way, you're reading it totally wrong. Because this passage is not at all talking about the Lord's Supper. And I will readily admit that you cannot help but think about the Lord's Supper when you read John 6. It would be a fantastic passage to talk through as we partake of the Lord's Supper, 
But Jesus does not have communion in view at all here. He is simply forecasting his death. Back in verse 4, we learn that this was close to Passover time. When Jesus is speaking these words, it is close to the Passover. Jesus participated in three Passovers during his earthly ministry. He has already participated in one. This is the second Passover. There's going to be a third Passover that he will participate in with his disciples later, and then he will go to the cross and give his life for the sins of mankind. This is the second Passover. At the third Passover, he will invite his disciples into a room, and he will share a last Passover with them at which he will institute the Lord's Supper. And you can find that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. For some reason, John leaves it out. But we're not at that third Passover yet. That is yet future. Jesus is at the second Passover over a year before he institutes the Lord's Supper, and he's simply talking about that next Passover where he will ascend Mount Calvary and give his life for the sins of mankind. And we could share so many reasons why, other reasons why, but John 6 is not communion. It is not the passage that teach about, teaches about the Lord's Supper. We could say that the Lord's Supper is about John 6, but John 6 is not teaching us about the Lord's Supper. It's not cannibalism. It's not communion. I suppose we could simply say that rather it is about Calvary. It is about the cross. And that's a lot of background. But it will allow us to much more quickly navigate through this passage. And it will make this passage come alive as we understand what Jesus really intended us to understand. The crowd to whom Jesus was speaking didn't have the luxury of hearing what you just heard. There's a lot of things that they didn't know. And all they did after is, is, is they just heard Jesus say this, this expression, I'm the bread from heaven. If you eat of me, you will have eternal life. That's all that they know. And they're in a tizzy over it. Verse 52, they strive among themselves. Whereas before Jesus was telling them about his origins, they were murmuring in verses 41 and 42, now they're arguing. And they're not arguing with Jesus. They're arguing, it says, with one another, among themselves. And my assumption here is that there were some who were starting to realize that Jesus could not be speaking literally here. He couldn't possibly be asking us to eat him. But if he wasn't speaking literally, what could he mean by this? And perhaps there were some who were starting to see maybe what Jesus might be saying, and, and they were giving it serious thought and saying, maybe he is from heaven. And others were shouting them down. He couldn't be. I've known Mary my whole life. He couldn't be from heaven. Maybe somehow he can give us life. There's no way. How can we possibly eat him and get life? And there's this argument. And whatever took place in that argument, they ended up defaulting back to that literal understanding of what Jesus said. Verse 52, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? How can this 32-year-old Jewish man who looks like just like us, who has grown up with many of us, how can he give us his flesh to eat? And this is what we see all over in John. Jesus is taking natural things that people understand, and he is, and he is applying them in a spiritual, divine way. And people have no clue what he's talking about. So he says to John, or to Nicodemus, you must be born again. You must be born from above. And Nicodemus says, well, how can I get back into my mother's womb? It's impossible. He says to a woman at the well, he says, I have living water that if you drink, you will never thirst again. And the woman says, how can I get this water? I'm so tired of coming to this well. Give me this water to drink. And it's how we as humans naturally respond to divine truth. We cannot understand God's truth unless God reveals it to us and unless God opens up our eyes to see it. And Jesus responds with an even more perplexing statement in verse 53. He says unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you. And you remember, this is the, the code that Jesus uses. This is the formula when he says, I, I, I want your attention. You need to understand what I'm about to say. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. If you were standing there listening to this as a Galilean Jew in the first century, you would have been like, wait, what? It's perplexing enough to think of eating Jesus' flesh, but drinking his blood? See, Leviticus strictly forbade the Jews from drinking blood. 
And it wasn't a matter of question. It was, it was very obvious that this is not something that they were to do. Leviticus 3, verse 17, for instance, says, It will be a perpetual statute for your generations throughout all your dwellings that you neither eat fat nor blood. It was not ambiguous. Leviticus 17, verse 10, Whatsoever there man there be of the house of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn among you that eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood, and I will cut him off from among his people. And the Jews knew this, and here comes this fellow saying, you need to eat my flesh and even drink my blood to have eternal life. But listen to how Leviticus 17 continues in verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. It is the blood that maketh atonement for the soul. Therefore, I say, do not drink of the blood. It was not unclear in the minds of the Jews that they were not to drink blood. But perhaps the reason why they were not to drink blood was not so clear. You don't eat blood because blood represents life. And if blood is flowing, it means that there has been a violent death. Something living has been pierced and its blood is coming out. There's a violent death that has occurred. And that's why you don't drink blood. Shed blood is for sacrifice. It's for atonement. It's not for drinking. And yet Jesus says in verse 53, except you drink of the blood of the Son of Man, you have no life in you. What could he be saying? He's not urging his hearers to break the law and start drinking literal blood. He is talking about the violent death. He is talking about substitutionary atonement. He is talking about a coming shedding of blood that will give life to those who don't have it. The Son of Man will give his life so that those who are dying will receive life. In verse 54, he'll state it positively, what he just said negatively. Verse 54, the positive spin on this, Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. This is why he came. John told us at the beginning in John chapter 1 and verse 14, the word became flesh. And this is why the word became flesh. Hebrews 2 verse 11, for as much as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For he took verily not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. That's why he came. That's why he took on flesh. The eternal self-existent Son of God entered into our time, space, and history, taking on human flesh, that ultimately he might give up that flesh to pay for our sins, to be mangled on the behalf of our sins. For generations, the throats of Passover lambs were slit and blood was spilt and life expired so that God's people could live for another year in fellowship with him. But the Lamb of God would at the next Passover, he would give his life not to, and shed his blood not to cover sins, but actually to take away the sins of the world. And Jesus says, eat of that flesh, drink of my blood, it's for you. And for some reason, he gets even more graphic and gruesome in his language. In verse 54, that word eateth, it's it's a different word than what we heard earlier in this text. It's a, it's a more graphic word. It actually means to gnaw or to chew. It's not a common word. It's a very, very graphic word that communicates this continual munching. If you continually partake of me, continually digest of me, you will possess life eternal. And people say that's gross. This sounds like cannibalism. No, maybe this is communion. And that's not it at all. If we just take communion, we'll be fine, but that's not it. Jesus simply means by this eating and drinking, he means for us the same thing that he meant in verse 40. If you parallel verse 40 with verse 
54, there, there's no ambiguity at all about what Jesus is speaking about. Verse 40, read this with me. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now, notice the echo in verse 54. Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. It's the same thing. And so, whether Jesus says eat or whether he says come and see and believe, he's talking about the same thing. It is that forward motion towards Christ. It's that positive, positive response to the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we respond to Jesus in that way, we have eternal life, verse 54. We possess it. It's ours now. And since it is for the fourth time in John chapter 6, Jesus says at the end of verse 54, he says, I will raise him up at the last day. The fourth time he says this. And essentially Jesus says over and over in John 6, if you partake of me, if you believe in me, if you come to me, if you see me, I will give you eternal life and I will keep you all the way to the end and I will raise you up at the last day. No question. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. When you partake of Christ, he gives you eternal life. You possess it now. All of the benefits of eternal life are yours now. And Jesus makes a promise to you that when you come to him, he will keep you all the way until the last day. And even if your body is, is rotting in a grave for 10 years or even 10,000 years, he will find you. And he will raise your body and give you a perfected body, join it with your already perfected soul, and you will live in glory forever. It's a guarantee. And here's why we can be sure. Verse 55, for my flesh is meat indeed. And my blood is drink indeed. Indeed means real. It means genuine. It means authentic. I am real food. I am real drink. Food and drink sustain physical life day by day. But Jesus, the true bread and true drink, sustains life forever. You can't get what Jesus offers from Sobeys. Several years ago, my wife and I noticed a flyer. This was back when we were in Moncton. It was announcing the grand opening of another Sobeys. And they were giving away $25 gift cards to the first 100 people that showed up on a Saturday morning, the grand opening. And uh, we were excited because $25 gift card, we'll take it, absolutely. There were some other sales that were going on, but it was Saturday morning. I'm like, who's going to get up on a Saturday morning at 8 and go to Sobeys? And so we just kind of strolled out the door at about 7, got there probably about 7.30, and, and we couldn't even get into the parking lot. There was, I mean... There was a lineup, it was a freezing cold morning, and there was a lineup going, I mean, from the door in circles all the way out to the road, and you, you couldn't find a place to park anywhere. I would have had to park way down the street and get in this line and, and probably not even get a gift card at the end of my time in that line, and we were disappointed. There's no way I was getting in that line. But then I felt really sad as I saw those people. And my wife and I commented that the next morning at my church and at other churches around Moncton, there was going to be an offer made of eternal life. That, and they didn't even have to get up at 7. They could have got, we start at 11 o'clock. We start preaching the word and offering eternal life. They could have slept in. But nobody would come to that. Why can't we draw a crowd like that? And the answer is we could. We could if we offered something fake. If we offered something that wouldn't last. If we offered something that was temporary, people will come. And prosperity preachers do this all the time. They offer the needs of the body, and people come in droves to hear these people. They click on them on the internet to hear with this message because they want the temporary needs of their body satisfied. And churches can so easily fall into this. You can offer fake food and fake drink, and people will come in droves to get that. But they won't come for the real stuff. They won't come for genuine life. And it says something about us as humans, doesn't it? We are so concerned about the temporary needs of our life that we totally neglect the, the eternal needs of our soul. Verse 56, Jesus offers again, He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. And now a wor new word enters into this discussion. The word dwelleth. It's such an important word in John. Normally it's translated as abide or remain. 
It speaks of intimacy. It speaks of union. And there are two unions in John that this word speaks to. First, it is the union between God the Father and God the Son. That the two of them abide together and eternally have abode together. But the second union that this word speaks to in the book of John is the union that Christ came to give to believers. Those who would believe in him and partake of him, they enter into that union with the Father and the Son. It's an incredible word and it's a huge consideration when we get to John chapter 15. The divine son has eternally been in union with the father and he comes to earth to make possible for sinful human beings to be washed that they might enter into that union. God dwells with Christ. Christ dwells with God and Christ dwells with believers and so believers dwell with God and with Christ. This is about a relationship. This invitation that Jesus, the bread of life, gives to eat and drink of him is an invitation to a relationship. It's about a dwelling together. That's precisely what verse 57 means. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. Eternal life is part of who God is. He's always lived, and he always will live. And he sent Jesus. Jesus, the one who has eternally enjoyed that heavenly life, that life of the Father, God sent him to a part Trinitarian life to believers. And Jesus is the mediator of that life. And those who eat of him will have it. And those who will not, will not. There is no other way to attain spiritual life than through Christ. And we end with another summary statement in verse 58, where Jesus says, This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna, perishable food, and they are dead. He that eateth of this bread, that is me, shall live forever. Have you eaten of the living bread? Have you drunk of the blood of Christ? This is an invitation. And his invitation demands a response from every one of us who hear these words. Some of us have never taken a bite. Some of us have never taken a sip. You have eaten only of food that perishes. You have only tasted of what this world can provide to meet the temporary needs of your body, and you need to understand how much you need Jesus. There is no spiritual life apart from partaking of Jesus. There is no eternal life apart from drinking of his blood, and you need to partake of Christ in order to avoid eternal death and to gain eternal life. It's the only way. Some of us are here, and we have eaten and drunk of Christ but we persistently forsake his food. We persistently go back to the world to try to meet needs for our body, and we try to do all these things to just survive life, and we're concerned about our health, and we want full bellies, and all of that is well and good, but sometimes we do so to the neglect of our spiritual life. And Jesus invites you to come too. You do need a full belly, but you need more than a full belly. You do need health. But you need more than a healthy body out of this life. You need to feast on Christ. The language of this passage is of this continual feeding, this continual gnawing, this continual dwelling, this ongoing digestion. Salvation is a relationship in which we abide. Eternal life has so much future to it, but it has so much that is, uh, that is experienced now. And oh, how we need to nourish ourselves with the heavenly bread that is Christ. Jesus invites all of us to come and to feast, just as he invited the crowd then. And we know how they responded to the invitation. They murmured. They argued among themselves. They said, this is a hard saying. And then in verse 62, they go away. We'll look at that next week. They leave him. They just said, forget this. How will you respond to the invitation this morning to partake of the body, of the flesh, and of the blood of Christ? Heavenly Father, we can't thank you enough for helping us by your Spirit to see the Word. And I I believe that your Spirit is working. We can't understand these things in the flesh. And we desperately need you to open up our eyes and to help us to understand. And I, I pray, God, that you will work in every heart, that you will help us all to respond to the invitation in a way that is positive, that we will come we'll see, that we'll believe, that we'll taste, eat, taste as 
of Psalm 34 says, taste and see that the Lord is good. And uh, help us to partake of him. Lord, if there is perhaps somebody here who's never really partaken at all, I, I pray that you will just open up their hearts to salvation today. Help them to see their need. And uh, for those of us who have partaken, help us to continue to come and to meditate, to feast on this true bread and this true drink that is Jesus Christ. We love you and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to close uh, with the song that just continues the invitation. It's just a, a song that invites you to come and to drink of the blood of Christ. And it's the hymn number 160, Are You Washed in the Blood? It was sing verses 1 and 2. And uh, I will be down front. And if, if you're saying, I, I've not been washed in the blood, I've never eaten of his flesh, I've never partaken, drunk of his blood. I've never really understood these things before, but I want to. I want this eternal life. I'll be down front. I'll be happy to meet with you even now, connect you with someone that will help you uh, to make sure uh, that you have eternal life. Uh, if you're not comfortable doing that, we'll be available in the back in the lobby, pastors, maybe somebody that you know that uh, came along with you today. Uh, please talk to somebody and make sure uh, that you have certainty of that. But as you sing this song, maybe you've partaken Let's just, let's just refresh ourselves again in, in what Christ has to offer us in being the bread of life, and let's partake of him today and as we go throughout this week. So stand, we'll sing verses 1 and 2 of number 160, Are You Washed in the Blood? Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? each moment in the crucified. What a thought. And I hope that that's what you think on as you leave. Are you feasting on Christ? He is so much. He is so much. And if we just come to him and partake, there's, there's just so much that he has to offer us. And so trust you've been encouraged. A couple of things. Uh, tonight, uh, we have a little bit of a different service at 6. We're having our Kids for Truth closing service. I urge you to come and uh, just see uh, what uh, our, our children have learned in Kids for Truth all throughout uh, this year. They'll be singing and sharing scripture with us. And I'll have a short devotional on uh, growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and uh, in, in preparation for that, we do need a couple fellows. If you could see Shelly Corser after the service, after the foyer gets cleared out a little bit, we'll be having an ice cream social uh, right in the lobby here. I think it's in the lobby here. I don't know where it is. Is it down there? Okay, <laughs> thank you. So see Shelly down there. I guess we can do that right away. And if uh, some people would help us set up some tables for that, um, that would be very, very, very helpful. So um, Brother Warren, would you mind uh, dismissing us in prayer, please?